Hey everyone, this is Derek and this is section 2.3. It's going to be about average rate of change. And this is going to tie in directly with what we just did in 2.1, which was slope of the line. So from 2.1, remember that we had slope of the line, this rise of a run, or this y2, y1 minus x2 minus x1. Um, the average rate of change of a function between two points A and B is going to be the equivalent of the same exact thing, the slope of a secant line through those points. Um, let me just kind of make a quick little sketch over here of what that could look like. Say I had some point A right here, and I put that in, and I get out some point F of A. And then let's say I have some other point over here, B, and I put that into this function, F, and I get out F, whatever that value is, at B. So then if I go to find my slope, my y2 minus 1, y1 becomes f of b minus f of a, so that's right there. And my x2 minus x1 becomes b minus a, that's right there. And so what we're doing is we're finding the slope of what's called a secant line when it goes through two points on a curve. Um, we're finding the slope of that secant line, um, and that's going to give us the average rate of change of that interval. And the instantaneous rate of change, if we were looking for that, and that's when this becomes calculus in a couple of quarters, would be what's called a tangent line. So it'd be just tangent at that one single exact point. That's the only spot it would, it would touch. Um, and so that slope would give us instantaneous rate of change. What the average is doing is giving us a starting point and an ending point and saying to get from here to here, that would be an average of this. But that said, all kinds of different things are happening in between. Okay, for this first question, um, we're asked to mark the two points on the graph that are needed to calculate the average rate of change over the interval, interval negative 4, negative 1. So we're asked to find the average rate of change between, let me just kind of mark it, between right here and right here. So this is the interval in which we are looking. And so then to do that, we would come up and we would mark our points. And so those would be the two points that we would need um, to calculate the average rate of change. And then it asks us to connect the points with the line segment. And I think on the homework, you're actually graphing these two points. And then there's a little line segment tool and that allows you to draw that. And then it asks you to find the average rate of change over that interval. Um, I always do better. So I'm going to write out the ordered pair because uh, I tend to screw it up less if I do that. Notice this negative 4, negative 1 is not on the graph. Negative 4 negative to negative 1 is this interval on which we're looking. So the points that actually <clears throat> go with that would be when x is negative 4, y is 4. And when x is negative 1, it looks like y is 1. Um, and so if we're thinking average rate of change in this case, we're basically we're just finding the slope of this line. That's all it is. We don't even need the function notation. So doing our um, y2 minus y1. And I'm just going to abbreviate average rate of change to this because it's too much to write. So average rate of change, I can also call it slope in this case, uh, would be 1 minus 4. And then x would be negative 1 minus negative 4. And that makes negative 3 minus minus, make that plus 4, negative 1 plus 4 for 3. And my average rate of change is negative 1. Again, same as the slope. And then we're just going to look at uh, average rate of change with a bunch of different prompts and kind of some different notation. So for number two, we got the graph P of T gives the price of an item over a nine-week period. Interpret P of three equals eight. So P of T, this would be in week three. Uh, the price is the, uh, the output. So the price would be $8. Um, calculate the average rate of change between the first and seventh weeks. Be sure to include units. Okay. So again, I like to mark those points and kind of get them written out so that I don't mess things up. So on week one, we'd be here. So that put, looks like in week one, the price was $8. And then in week seven, things were not looking as good. And in week seven, the price had dropped to $2. So we should expect a uh, negative average rate of change this time, right? Because our price is decreasing. And so now if I go ahead and find my, my slope, which is the same as my average rate of change, 
This would be 2 minus 8, and then 7 minus 1. And so negative 6 over 6, and another one where it comes out to negative 1. And I think probably if I drew that, yeah, if you connect that with a line segment, you can confirm by over 1, down 1, over 1, down 1. Oh, I forgot my units. So um, this was dollars, was our Y, and then weeks was our X. Remember, this is change in Y over change in X. So just look at what your you know axes are, and that's your units. So it's dropping $1 every week. Uh, for this next part, we're finding average rate of change, but this time instead of giving a graph from a table, but it's, it's actually kind of easier because the order points are a little easier to see. Um, so the following chart shows overdose deaths in the United States between 2010 and 2017. So there's our, our data. Uh, calculate the average rate of change of deaths between 2014 and 2017. So 2014 um, is here and 2017 is there. So this would be our output. So I'll go Y2 minus Y1 and then X2 minus X1. As you can see, if I wrote those sideways, right, it would be, those are our Y's. So this will be 7,237 minus 47055. And then over 2017 minus 2014. This is our average rate of change. And let's see, when I did that, I got 23... 1,182 over 3, and I think I rounded my answer to the nearest uh, whole number. Okay, and then part B is asking us to interpret our answer to part A, and so this would be 7,727, and this would be, um, remember we do change in Y over change in X, and so that will be um, deaths Per year. Uh, so that means that it's increasing by a rate of 7,727 deaths per year. Okay, number four, uh, same idea, but this time from a verbal description. So the third month this year, you have uh, $478 saved. The eighth month this year, you have $1,118 saved. What is your savings rate? Be sure to include units. Um, so let's write those as ordered pair. In the third month, so when T is three, you have this many dollars. And then in the eighth month, so when T is eight, you're gonna have that many dollars. And then we'll find our average rate of change. So that will go uh, kind of the Y2, Y1, and then X2 minus X1. And that came out to 640 over five, which was 128. And then, remember, our input was time, so again, change in Y, which is dollars, over change in X, which in this case was months. And so that means she's saving $128 per month. Okay, this next example, uh, find the average rate of change on the interval from an equation. So this time we're actually given an F of X and we're asked to find it um, over this interval. And so here, I'm gonna bring back kind of this bit more formal definition. So average rate of change, the F of B minus F of A over B minus A on the interval A, B. And so this is exactly what this equate is now looking like. So here we would have to find F of, oops, look at this. So here we're going to have to find um, f of 3 minus f of negative 2 over b, so that's 3 minus negative 2. So that's our goal to find our average rate of change, so then I'll get that set up. And let me just take a second and show you what we're actually doing. This is basically a parabola. It would be one opening up instead of opening down like this. But basically we're being given two points and we've been told these X values 
Um, you know, this one would look something more like that. And so we've been given negative two and three. What we're gonna do here is plug in three. We're gonna get the Y value go that goes with that. And that will be our first Y, a second Y, I guess. And we'll plug in this other value and that will give us our, our other Y value. And that's gonna give us our change in. And then down here, we're just doing that same change in X. So F of three, uh, this will look like three times three squared plus four. And I wrote five for absolutely no good reason whatsoever. Let's go four. And that is F of three. And we're gonna subtract from that F of negative two. So we'll just plug negative two in here. And then three minus negative two is really three plus two. So we're just gonna call that a five. And then let me do a little bit of cleaning up in here. This could be 27 plus four. So that should be 31 minus, let's see, this will be negative and then squared makes positive. So four times three would be 12 plus four over five, which is 31 minus 16 over five. And 31 minus 16 would be uh, 15. I just wrote, sorry about that, 15 there, because that was coming up over five. And so that makes my average rate of change three. So if we graph this um, and then drew a line between negative two and three on it, and we counted those boxes, we would find that the slope of that line is three. Okay, for this last question, we're going to find the average rate of change on the interval x comma x plus h. So what would that be? This is if we started at some spot X, and then let's say from X, I decided I was gonna go some distance H over here to my next point. You know, like if this is three and, and this was two units, I would go three plus two, that would be X plus H. So what we're finding is the average rate of change of this function on the interval between X and X plus H, where those could be basically any values. Um, I'm going to point out we're finding the average rate of change of a line. So the average rate of change of a line should be the same thing as the slope. I'm super hoping that horn will go off soon. Yay, the horn stopped. Um, and so I think I was saying, <clears throat> I'm going to point out that we're finding the average rate of change of a line. So it, we should get five. It doesn't matter, and that's why we're doing these in sort of general form here. It doesn't matter where I look on the line, the slope should be constant everywhere. So let's see how that works with this. So our average rate of change is going to be, uh, F, sorry, this is G this time. So G of um, X plus H minus G of X over X plus H minus X. If I evaluate this at x plus h, that's going to look like a 5, and then x plus h is going in. If this said g of 3, you know how we plug a 3 here? We're going to plug an x plus h there. That's all that's happening. And then subtract g of x. Okay, this is g of x. Oops, I almost forgot my 3. Now subtract g of x. And then that's all going to be over x plus h minus x. Cool, those x's drop out. We do that. And now let's distribute so we can collect terms. So 5x plus 5h minus 3 minus 5x and then plus 3 all over h. And now if I cancel my like terms, it should be magical. Min uh, 5x minus 5x plus 3 minus 3. And we're left with 5h over h h over h cancels, and so for all cases, the slope of that line truly is five. So we just did a lot of math to kind of prove that this is five. Um, where this becomes a lot more interesting is when we get the difference quotient, which is actually the next section. Um, it won't be that interesting there because it's still gonna be a linear function. Uh, but once these are curvy functions, then this idea, this thing that we just did here, which was actually sneaking into the difference quotient, which is our, our next section coming up, um, that becomes the basis for all of Calc 1. So it's actually a, a pretty important idea.